Tonight, it is my sincere pleasure and great honor to welcome Peter Edelman to Montgomery College. Professor Edelman has enjoyed a long and distinguished career in public service, one that began shortly after he graduated from Harvard University, a school that he says, and I quote, he attended sort of by mistake. I should make such mistakes. Uh, Professor Edelman worked with the Department of Justice during the Kennedy administration, clerked for Supreme Court uh, Justice Arthur Goldberg, served as a legislative assistant to Robert F. Kennedy, and was an advisor to Senator Ted Kennedy during his presidential campaign in 1980. He served in the Clinton administration as an assistant secretary in the Department of Health and Human Services, but resigned from that post after President Clinton signed a welfare reform bill in 1996. I have reform in quotes, so Thank I you. think you like that. In between uh, stints in the public sector, Professor Edelman has practiced law, and in 1982, he joined the faculty at the Georgetown University Law Center. He has been there in one capacity or another ever since. Throughout his career, Professor, uh, <coughs> Professor Edelman has been drawn to subjects of poverty and income inequality in America. Much of his life has been dedicated to ending the former and ameliorating the latter. In his most recent book, which he has signed for me, so rich, so poor. Peter Edelman asks why a nation with a gross national product or gross, uh, gross national income of over $14 trillion cannot seem to end poverty. He has shared his wisdom with generations of lawmakers and law students. He has shared his wisdom with some of the titans of modern journalism, including Stephen Colbert. Tonight, he will share it with us. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Edelman. Well, thank you so much, Professor Thompson. Uh, I'm very glad to be at Montgomery College. Uh, I, this is the first time I've been at your campus, even though I live pretty nearby uh, in the district. Uh, of course, if I'd been here I would two years ago or four years ago, I don't think I'd recognize what you look like now. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of exciting things happening here, uh, I think. Uh, I, I want to especially thank your dean, uh, Joan Nag, for reaching out to invite me and her husband, Larry, for braving the rush hour traffic to get us uh, here on time. And wonderful to see uh, all of you who are here. Uh, my only plea is if anybody would listen, please come closer. But it's just like my students. Don't worry, my, my students do the same thing. See, nobody moved. Um, the, uh, this is a, a subject uh, that we're not doing enough about in our country, right? That's why, we're, why I wrote this book, why we're uh, all here. Uh, and what I want to talk about uh, tonight is, is uh, not so much, although if anybody wants to ask, I can speak to it, not so much about the issues right now. Uh, the issues we face in our politics now, and uh, that includes both uh, the, in the Congress and, and uh, in the current political campaign, uh, are very, very disturbing about uh, what we're doing about uh, our public policy, uh, about low-income people, uh, people in poverty uh, in our, our country. Uh, the, we, we could have a, a long discussion, and we need to, as a people and as a country, uh, about what we're doing right now and the threats uh, that are out there from uh, those uh, who want to cut back on things that we're doing that make a huge difference for low-income people. But what I want to talk about uh, is really the history, is really the framework, is really how we got uh, to where we are uh, right now uh, in, in uh, all of this. Uh, what we need to be doing for the long run is better. Uh, we need to be uh, reducing uh, the 46 million people who we have in poverty. That number needs to go down. Right now, what we have to do, those of us who care about these things and who believe in the importance of the, of the role of government and the role of public policy, along with what we do privately and in our communities, 
But we need to do, I think, not only now, but uh, regardless of who is the, uh, the president, uh, we have to play defense about what we have. But my purpose, as I say, is to put things uh, in a larger context. What we want to accomplish uh, is a country in which uh, everyone uh, who is, is uh, of age uh, can have a good job, a job that pays enough to live on, live in a healthy community, uh, have opportunity, a wonderful public school system for children to go to, no matter who they are, no matter where they live, uh, and a decent safety net. A lot more things to talk about, uh, which we'd have to have a whole course, uh, uh, many, many uh, hours to get into that are, that are some of the details. Having affordable housing, uh, having a health and mental health system uh, that works uh, for uh, everybody. A uh, long list of things, uh, uh, early childhood, a criminal justice system that, that, that's fair, uh, dealing with domestic violence, uh, in so far, particularly in so far, but obviously for women uh, of all uh, income levels, but it has so much to do with poverty. So there's a long list of things uh, that would be on a full, uh, a list of a full uh, discussion, or part of a full discussion. Uh, if we were to put ourselves in the position, as some of us with some gray in our hair could do, of how this all looked uh, in 1968, uh, and for the rest of you, you just have to trust what we remember. Uh, we, at that time, I think, uh, really thought that we were on the road to ending poverty in this country. Uh, we had uh, had uh, the war on poverty, we had had a lot of changes during the New Frontier and the Great Society and the results of civil rights. And, and of course, our general feeling uh, any time about the future is to extrapolate from the present, to think that the future is an extension of, of the present uh, in some way. And if you think about the now, uh, f about almost 45 years uh, since uh, uh, President Johnson left the presidency, since uh, we lost Robert Kennedy, Dr. King, others in the 1960s. Uh, a lot has happened that really we didn't uh, think about. Well, just for one thing, and I'm going to go into detail about this uh, as I develop my remarks, but uh, in 1968, the elderly were the poorest group in our country. Uh, rather quickly, actually, in the 1970s, we took steps of public policy, successful steps of public policy, to uh, index Social Security to create supplemental security income, SSI, that helps the income of, of the elderly and the disabled. And the elderly became the least poor age group in our country. At the same time, starting in the 1970s, and I'll say more about this, we began to have a wave, uh, a flood, a flood tide uh, of low-wage jobs, and children became the poorest age group uh, in our country because their parents, and especially if they lived in, in a household with a single mom, uh, earned so little. We didn't foresee that in 1968. In 1968, we still had the jobs in the steel mills and the jobs in the car plants and the strength of the unions, and, and it built the middle class. We didn't foresee that all that was going to go away uh, and be replaced by all the low-wage jobs uh, that came afterwards. Uh, we didn't foresee the changes in family structure that have, have uh, actually occurred around the world, but that have left us with so many single parents, especially single mothers, trying to support their children uh, in a low-wage uh, world. We um, didn't foresee the changes in immigration in our country that have, have also contributed, whatever else we believe about it, uh, in terms of especially the undocumented side that have, that have added workers at that low-wage end uh, competing for the jobs. We didn't foresee, even though we had had civil 
unrest in our cities in the 1960s, that the conditions that people were protesting in that the violence that took place uh, in the cities would actually, those conditions would actually get worse uh, in our inner cities over the uh, period uh, of the next 40 uh, plus years. Uh, we didn't foresee the uh, tremendous growth of the income of people at the very top in our, in our society. Uh, we've become a society of gated communities and ghettos, of yachts and people with no boats at all, private jets and people and children whose wings are clipped long before they could even consider flying. So what happened after 1968, what we foresaw and hoped and thought would happen, um, did not. What is, what, what is that all about in more detail? You know, Ronald Reagan uh, once said that we had fought a war on poverty, and poverty won. Now, I think Ronald Reagan said a lot of things that were wrong, and that's one of them. He, uh, yet if you look at the fact that we have 46 million people in poverty now, you might think maybe he was right. So we need to unpack that. We need to understand that. The first thing to remember is that we have public policies that work, and I already mentioned Social Security and SSI and the elderly. We have public policies that are successful, that are keeping 40 million people out of poverty. Right now, as, as we sit here this evening, not just Social Security, which is far and away the largest uh, item over the 20 million of those 40 million people, but also food stamps, the earned income tax credit, the child tax credit, uh, public housing and housing vouchers, uh, a, quite a long list of things that are successful public policy. So when we read, there was just a, a piece uh, again in the New York Times uh, this very morning about how we're spending $800 billion a year or whatever the number is on public policies that help poor people, and we still have 46 million poor people, and so therefore we're doing everything wrong. That is incorrect. We have successful public policy, but we still have 46 million people in poverty. So what's going on? The first thing, and it's, it's uh, really the heart of, of what the discussion should be uh, in our country now, and that is the flood of low-wage work to which I referred. Because with the, the globalization, with the weakening, weakening of unions, with the fact that the minimum wage did not keep up, uh, and, and uh, especially globalization, uh, we had those jobs that I mentioned go away, and they were replaced, but they were replaced by jobs that pay much, much less. And we know what they are. They, they're, uh, they actually subsidize our lives. When we go to a fast food restaurant that pays uh, uh, enough, not enough to live on, uh, we're getting, uh, a, a, in effect, a discount uh, at the expense of somebody who's working for low wages. Uh, so when we go uh, to many different retail stores, same thing. Uh, and we have the irony, the spectacle, I'm not sure what word to use, that we have people who uh, work uh, for an employer for very low wages, and the only way they make it is by getting food stamps, by getting, if they have children, the earned income tax credit, uh, by getting the, the child tax credit. We have publicly funded jobs, uh, home health care, where the average pay for someone doing this very important work of home health care. The average pay is less than the poverty line for a family of four. I haven't mentioned what that is. It's about $23,000 right now. So I mean, the average wage for the home health worker is $22,000. Uh, daycare, child care, Head Start, 
Average pay, $17,000, less than the poverty line for a family of three, which is about $19,000 right now. There's something wrong with that picture when even on a job that's created by public policy, the, the uh, person who has that job has to get food stamps or the earned income tax credit or the child tax credit to make at least uh, a better income. Not really necessarily enough to live on, but just better. So here's what we have. We have half the jobs in our country that pay less than $34,000 a year. If you have the job full time and all year long, half the jobs in the country. Now, uh, is every family uh, earning who has a low wage job bringing home only $34,000? And that's, that's the middle level. That's, the, that's below $34,000 for half the jobs. No, because when we found in the 1970s that there were so many low wage jobs where you had two parents, mom, generally mom, who had not been working, went out and went to work. Sometimes she wanted to, sometimes she wasn't so sure, but she did go out uh, and work. If she was by herself, only one job was available. So a quarter of the jobs in the country pay less than the poverty line for a family of four, pay less than $22,000, $23,000. Not only are these jobs very low wage, but people are stuck. The, the ability to, to uh, earn more money, uh, get to a job where you're making a lot more money, has diminished tremendously because there aren't that more jobs to, to get up the line. Uh, and those jobs below that $34,000 level, they have, their wage has increased a grand total of 7% in real terms, after you take inflation into account, a grand total of 7% in 40 years, a fifth of a percentage point uh, each year, if you do the arithmetic. Uh, so there's, now the economy didn't grow at that rate, right? We all know the economy about doubled in size. And uh, we know very well, I don't have to give you all those numbers about the 1% and the 99%, uh, which Occupy uh, at least brought to our public attention, uh, at least gave us a, a, a bumper sticker. Um, but it's really factually true. All, all, of the, all of the increase went to a very small number of people at the top. And people have been getting uh, the frustration. You can see it in our politics. You can see the anger. You can see people wondering. Uh, thinking uh, nothing can be done about this, uh, thinking that must be their own fault. So this is the fundamental, fundamental problem that we need to have on the table, have on the front burner, be part of our national uh, discussion. And it's also a major part of the issue of poverty itself. So even as to those who are in poverty, if you look at the census numbers, 61% of the income that comes into the homes of people who actually have incomes below the poverty line comes from work. It's not two different groups of people. It's not some difference in kind, some other kind of people. Uh, most people who become poor get out of poverty. All the more reason why we ought to have a decent safety net. Now, there is certainly a, a, a group of people who are persistently poor, who are intergenerationally poor. I want to talk more about that in a little while. But the basic fact is this question of low-wage work permeates everything. And let's understand how many people we're talking about. I've said 46 million uh, in poverty. The number of people who were below twice the poverty line Right below 38,000 for a family of three. The number of people, that's where all the research tells us that you begin to be able to pay for lots of people. You begin, they begin to be able to pay their bills every month. They don't have to think about, even if they have health insurance, about 
the deductible, uh, the cost sharing, uh, before they even go to the doctor. That's 106 million people. More than a third of our people have incomes below twice the poverty line. So this is a gigantic problem, the whole question of low-wage work. Now secondly, uh, so that's, you know, the, my question is why is it so hard to end poverty in America? One of the answers is because we have so much low-wage work uh, in, in our country and that it's been with us a long time and we're not giving, a, essentially being honest uh, about what the issue is. Secondly, uh, if the first is really a phenomenon about the way our economy functions, Right, about globalization, about the fact that, that uh, it's really changed our position in the world. Uh, the second is uh, more self-inflicted in the sense that we have ripped a hole, big hole in the safety net at the very bottom. And what I'm talking about is cash assistance for, for mothers and children, largely uh, single moms, a few single dads in there too, but mostly women and children, uh, welfare, uh, aid to dependent families with dependent children as it used to be, temporary assistance for needy families uh, as it is now. We have, uh, I've mentioned it a number of times, I talked about those 40 million people who are being kept out of poverty by our public policies. We have a pretty good safety net. Uh, it's not, it's a patchwork. You know, we did a little here, a little there. We have some food stamps here. We have some low-income energy assistance over there. We have some housing vouchers someplace else, you know. Uh, but if you're working, uh, because we have sort of quietly understood that we have too much low-wage work, uh, if you're working and you have children, uh, you get some help. The, the people that we've turned on in the society uh, are, are, are people who uh, don't have work, whether it's at a particular time or for a longer period of time. And so we changed the law in 1996. And what we said was no more legal right to get help, right? Everybody's got to go to work. We didn't really particularly help those people uh, get work. They did pretty well in the hot economy uh, of the last part of the 20th century, the last five years of the 20th century. Uh, but we're, we've sort of turned a blind eye to what's happened since. Uh, and, and here's what I mean. Uh, the, uh, first of all, the numbers of people who are on welfare, and by the way, compared to food stamps, food stamps has been a tremendous help in this recession. So. Recession, I told you, 26 million to 46 million food stamps. Welfare, TANF, down to 3.9 million. It had been too high when President Clinton took office. It had been 14 million. It needed to be changed. There needed to be much more help for people to get a job. We were doing it wrong. But instead, we turned it over to the states, complete block grant. You can help people if you want to. No legal obligation to help anybody. They took the, too many of them took the, uh, the uh, invitation. And so in the recession, 3.9 million, you know, with all the need that there was out there, went to, guess what, 4.4 million. 20 million food stamps, 500,000 TANF. Tells you what's happened. Used to be 68% of children in poor families before, before the change in the law in 1996. 68% of them got cash assistance. 27%. Now, half the states, fewer than 20% of children in poor families getting cash assistance. Wyoming wins the contest. Has on any given day about 600 people in the whole state getting cash assistance. Fewer than 4% of, of the children in poor families in the state of Wyoming. So we have these political attacks that talk about ending the work requirements, President Obama ending the work requirements, and, and uh, therefore everybody's going to get their welfare. What they don't mention is that welfare doesn't exist anymore functionally in about half the country, and it's gone way down in a, in a bunch of uh, other places. Just don't talk about that. 
So we need to understand that. We need to understand what's happened. We, we off, obviously, people want to work. The number of people who don't want to work is very, very small. Um, and we need to have a decent safety net at the bottom. And that's the place where we've blown a hole. So why is it so hard to end poverty? Well, uh, getting cash assistance if you're that poor isn't ending your poverty. It's just meaning you uh, can survive a, a tough period of time. Third thing, and here is the place where I think we've actually uh, done uh, the least well, and that is uh, the, the uh, continuing issues of concentrated poverty in our country. All of the research shows that when you get too many poor people, low-income people, living in the same place, bad things happen. Uh, it gets, it's, it's connected to, to uh, things that happen uh, in terms of the structures that are there that are supposed to be serving people, so the schools uh, are less good, we know that. Uh, kids drop out of school, there's more crime, there's more violence, there are more family problems. They're just every place you look in these communities, uh, there's deep trouble. And that's a very, what we need to do about that uh, is it's, it's a relatively small number of people who are in poverty at any one time, but it is a group that tend to stay in poverty. Uh, Things that I was talking about, the answers in terms of, of good jobs are the economic policy we have as a country. Uh, it relates to uh, get, raising the minimum wage, which we can do in our states, but really there should be a, lar a higher national minimum wage. Thing, policies that we have that get more child care to people, that's also income. Uh, the health care bill where President Obama, with his leadership, has resulted in, in 16 million people aged 18 to 64 getting Medicaid. That's a fantastic thing. Uh, th that has an income effect. So I can give you a list of things that would help us at least on, on low-wage work that are national legislation and things that people would do at the state level. And I can say the same thing about the, the, the safety net. If we're going to make progress on the question of concentrated poverty in our inner cities, and concentrated poverty is obviously a huge question on Indian reservations and in Appalachia, in the Mississippi Delta, uh, in the colonias of South Texas, it's rural as well. But in our cities, it's, it's a challenge to those communities themselves, to the civic leadership uh, uh, of the communities, the political leadership, the business, the unions, uh, faith-based, uh, all of that. Uh, it's much more, and I feel this so strongly when I get outside of the Beltway uh, and talk to real people. Uh, my neighbors are real, but I, you know what I mean. Um, I was in Chicago yesterday, and I was at Chicago State University, and I, and I looking at a largely African-American community of learners who are there working very hard uh, in a low, from a low-income neighborhood to, to get to the next place, to, to make a better life for themselves and their family. And in, so in a city like Chicago or New York or Los Angeles or any of our big cities, uh, maybe Detroit is somewhat harder, um, we just need to have people who come together locally, including from within those communities. We need the one-on-one -on -one help. We need the tutoring, the mentoring, the working with families, the volunteers, all of that, as well as the public policy. So that's a huge, huge challenge. I mean, why did that happen? At the same time that the whole economy went bad for people at the bottom that I already talked about in the early 70s, if the economy caught a sort of a bad cold, bad permanent cold, uh, in terms of low-wage work then. Uh, in the inner cities, what happened uh, was that because of the Fair Housing Act, because of the increase in income and the, and the formation uh, of a black middle class in our country in the 1960s, uh, because of all of that, uh, the, the uh, people who could get out 
you know, there'd been all that violence, left. And uh, neighborhoods, not everybody, but neighborhoods were left with uh, an increasingly poor population proportion, and that's why uh, we've ended up with these inner city uh, issues. Just to put that uh, on the table, that it's, it, it's not some accident, it's what the historical uh, facts are. All right, so that's, that's the, the third challenge. So when, when we're talking about the inner city, we're particularly talking uh, about children. We have to, we absolutely have to break the cycle. Uh, and so uh, it means one of the things which is particularly a, a, another challenge, but within that to, to uh, at the local level, with federal funding, is start with prenatal care. Let's talk about child development. Let's talk about France does it beautifully, although we don't tend to learn, I mean, you know, if we're in Maryland, we don't learn from Delaware, or Delaware doesn't learn from us, right? They, they need to learn from us. But, uh, so, uh, it's hard to use the examples of others, but we should have a system in our, every community where the head start and the, and the early childhood development and the, the, the child care, the pre-K, all of that should be a, a system. You know, you get out of head start at two o'clock in the afternoon, what are you supposed to do? Get out of head start in the, in the summertime. There is no head start in the summertime. So we need that. And that's the, you can put money out there from Washington, that's not gonna happen unless there is a community working together to make it happen. And then, of course, the, the efforts and, and uh, here in Montgomery County with Jerry Wiest and everything that you've done with your schools, there's a lot of good things that have, have happened. But in so many parts of our country, uh, we haven't had uh, the, the, the same success with our public schools. That's a huge challenge. And especially as young people get older. And again, I'm, I'm putting together both the question of the inner city and more broadly, but the, the greatest urgency uh, is in the inner city, and we are losing the, 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 we have a criminal justice system which is simply incarcerating, and, and it's turned into a prison industrial complex, and we have, we're locking up more people than any, uh, more of our people, than any industrialized country, any advanced uh, economy, uh, and they're disproportionately African American, Latino, also Native uh, American, but it isn't just a cradle to prison pipeline. It isn't just tackling reform in the juvenile justice system and the criminal justice. There's also a cradle to nowhere pipeline. There, we're losing young people. If you look at the numbers, there are three to five million young people, ages 18 to 24, who are not in school, don't have a job, and that goes on for two years or more. That's what the number shows, disconnected youth and it's disproportionately uh, young people of color. So to have a set of pathways, uh, to have ladders of opportunity uh, beyond everywhere, beyond the inner city, but especially the inner city and in those rural areas, it's a huge challenge for us in our country. Now, all of this, uh, I think we need to talk uh, we've talked about gender, right, haven't we? We've talked about single moms in those low-wage jobs. We've talked about single moms disproportionately uh, in those conditions of absolute poverty, deep uh, poverty. Uh, out of the 20 million people who are in deep poverty, what, what a huge number of people in having uh, incomes below uh, the, the, the uh, poverty line. So we've talked about women if we haven't sort of put the label on it. Race has so much to do with poverty in this country. First of all, the numbers. 27% um, African American, same Latino, same Native American, they happen to all be the same. Now mind you, we've made progress. When we started measuring poverty at the beginning of the 1960s, 55% of African Americans were poor. Um, and in, in, in one Slightly more than a decade, from 1959 to 1973, we lowered that to well below 40%. And then it went down further under Bill Clinton, 
to, to tw even with the welfare changes, went down further to 22% and it's now 27%. So we've done some things right, but we still have that gap. 27% for people of color, about 10% for white. So that's a number. But secondly, there is the question of, of uh, the sort of political attitudes here, the, the assumptions that too many people make uh, that this is, not even considering Latinos, that this is a black problem in, in our country and, and uh, it, is, it is, uh, affects the politics. It affects the politics. Uh, since I mentioned Ronald Reagan, many of you will remember, uh, again, with a little gray in your hair, you don't have to go all the way back to the 1960s, but Ronald Reagan talked about the woman who came in her white Cadillac to the supermarket uh, and went in there with her food stamps and bought the choicest cut of beef. That was race politics. And it's been going on really for decades. Uh, you will also remember the, some of the somewhat older people, Willie Horton, uh, and the first George Bush's uh, campaign for president uh, and the ad about Willie Horton, who was a man who had uh, been on leave for prison furlough and committed a terrible crime, and he's, he's a black man. So I think we need more honesty about that. But this, th there's, there's two facts to keep in mind here, right? Uh, we can do that. To c we can keep two facts in mind at the same time? Yeah. Uh, the largest number of people who are poor in our country are white. That's the largest group who are poor. African American, Latino, disproportionately poor, but fewer in number. It's worth saying out loud. At the same time that we say the disproportionality, the, the gap, the 27% versus the 10% needs to end, we need to work uh, on that. We need to change the politics uh, as well. So I think that has to be on the table, those facts about the politics and how it works, that needs to be on the table if we're gonna face up to why it's so hard to end poverty uh, in America. Uh, I'm, I think this, there's a larger challenge. I mean, you think I've done enough here. Uh, in terms of the challenges, but I think that it's really a challenge uh, to what our country's about. Uh, it's really a challenge to our democracy. The inequality that has grown between the top and the bottom, the, 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 the resulting political power at the top of the large corporations and, and wealthy individuals, the effects of the Citizens United decision on campaign finance just makes the, the uh, task so much harder. Uh, and I don't think we can have so much that kind of power at the top without becoming a very different uh, country. Uh, I, I just, we need to figure out how, um, if you will, to turn the idea of Occupy into a political movement. Because all of what I'm talking about, some of these things are civic responsibility, and I insist on that. All of this is a matter of personal responsibility, and I and we all insist on that. Nobody, nobody succeeds in this country if they don't take responsibility for themselves. So our strategies and our ideas have to include that as well as the public policy. That is all true. But we just can't have these disparities and, and remain the democracy that we ought to be. Uh, it has to change. I would just close, uh, as I always do, uh, by a very short, powerful statement from Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who was the great rabbi friend of Dr. King. Uh, I realized the other day that, that he uh, was ahead of his time about Twitter here, because uh, this is a great tweet. So what he said was, we're not all guilty, we're not all guilty, but we are all responsible. Thanks for the chance to be with you this evening.
Good evening, Professor. Hi. As bad as things are now in regards to joblessness and poverty, I was wondering how you anticipate us being able to combat them in the future and with uh, ever improving technologies, you know, capable of replacing manpower. I, I think that we have a huge challenge, first of all, that we can't get each other. Uh, the economy is going to get better. Uh, where we are uh, now is, is uh, still very much uh, the effects of the recession and, and too many people still out of work. I think we will get past that, although uh, in a painfully slow way. But you know, it's been happening month after month. So the larger question is, uh, what are the jobs going to be like? Uh, it's not so much is the unemployment going to, going to be uh, high on a continuing basis. I, I don't know what number, maybe not back down to 4%. But um, how we get an, enough good jobs, uh, some of it relates to having the good sense to, to uh, run a full employment, uh, our, our macroeconomic policy. Uh, the kinds of things that we do with trade, uh, things like NAFTA in the future, uh, really insisting on, on uh, fair labor standards in the countries that we enter into the treaties with and environmental uh, standards. Uh, I do think we're going to be, as wages go up in China and India and other places, I think it's going to be helpful for jobs uh, in this country and pay for jobs in this country, but having, and, and then things I already said before about uh, if we invest in national needs like childcare, like housing, uh, and, and with uh, making the Pell Grants uh, more, more adequate, all of that helps uh, incomes. Um, but I, the heart of it is, is uh, two things. One is what can we do as a matter of public policy to, to uh, maximize the number of good jobs, the, the uh, sort of middle level jobs that are possible and that are going to be, many of them be there anyway. Healthcare is going to be a huge source of jobs and we're also going to have retirements of baby boomers. But the other side of it is making sure that for the jobs that we have, the middle skill jobs that we have, which are the kind of backbone of the jobs of the future, they require education. They require uh, the people who get to come to Montgomery College are getting the sort of education and background uh, to, be, uh, to, to take those jobs. But that isn't what we're doing fully enough uh, as a country. So we've got to look at two sides of the equation. We've got to look at the whole long list of things that I said and then some on the side of, of having the jobs that pay the best and in effect adding to the income in the ways that I said. But then people have to be prepared for those jobs, or otherwise uh, they'll disappear, they'll go someplace else, uh, something bad will happen. And so we have a tremendous challenge, uh, in, and especially in the, in the community colleges uh, uh, around the country, that's a huge part of the engine of skill development in our, in our country uh, that we have not, President Obama started, he started an initiative well, that was part of his student loan reform, which, by the way, is another good thing that President Obama did. Um, and then it got cut off. They didn't have enough money coming from Congress to do it. So it's terrifically important, it's just crucially important that, that a part of the strategy is making sure that we, have, that we are making the skills available to everybody, going back to what I said in terms of the uh, questions of inner cities and so on. So that's. That's my kind of overall vision about it. Thank you. Thank you for the question. It couldn't be more important. Good evening, sir. Um, after RFK, the next politician that I can think of who was willing to make poverty a big priority, uh, the next politician I can think of was John Edwards. And now that he's mm. been defrocked or deposed, are there any politicians who are still talking about poverty in a big way? And if not, why do you think there is no political will to talk about this vital issue? Well, I think that that's our fault. But uh, could I say Paul Wellstone instead of John Edwards? Would that be all right? Uh, you know what I mean. The, uh, uh, there are people who are in public office who care about these things. Uh, not enough. 
but you know, you think about Henry Waxman from California, Rosa DeLauro from Connecticut, Jim McDermott from uh, the state of Washington, uh, and, and some senators, I think Sherrod Brown from Ohio. Uh, but, but I think that we don't, uh, unless you have this, these very unusual people who we can't depend on coming along, you know, who really, with that special extra passion and sort of larger than life, um, can't count on that. Uh, and it has to come from all of us. It has to come from people all over the country who uh, understand that this is important to the country. You know, it, it's, it's vitally important. We're losing $600 billion a year uh, to our country because of all the people that are in poverty. All of the costs of uh, lack of product, production productivity the costs of incarceration, the costs of bad health. Uh, employers need to understand that it's in their interest to have workers who get paid well. That's the Henry Ford idea. Not that I'm a fan of Henry Ford in some major respects. Uh, but he understood that. Franklin Roosevelt understood that uh, in the New Deal. The, the people who, who have a wage, uh, they buy stuff. So I think it's a question of, of how do we, big question, how do we get started the kind of, of uh, movement from the bottom that really demands this, uh, both in terms of who it elects, but even once they're elected, whether they made a promise or even if they didn't, uh, the holding of the, of the match, the flame to their backside. We've all heard the claim that the, uh, that the wealthy are job creators, but I argue with a friend of mine that the very fact that someone is wealthy means they've accumulated the wealth and not spent it on creating jobs. Is that a correct argument? And can you give me more armament? <laughs> yes. Uh, well, you, you know, the, 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 there's, there's sort of two different points here. Uh, one which is absolutely true, which is uh, having a healthy economy. That's different from having all the, all the growth grow to a few people uh, and not charging them any, any taxes because they're the job creators. But having a, a healthy economy is the strongest weapon against poverty, better than anything else. And the last thing that we want to have to do is to have these safety nets. We want the minimum number of people in those safety nets. So uh, it's at the same time, the rising tide is not going to raise all the boats. It, it is an, the rising tide is really important. But there are going to be people who are left behind in a variety of ways, whether it's in terms of, of education or in terms of, of things that happen in their life later on and all of that. So just, just to put that uh, in there. I mean, the, 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 the job creator argument is the pr practically uh, as old as Adam and Eve. Uh, Trickle down, right? Just, just give us all the money up here and uh, we'll sprinkle a little bit out there and uh, everything will be great, especially for us. Um, so it just doesn't work that way. Uh, the, the, the short answer to somebody who tells you that uh, is, is evidence, uh, is uh, the evidence over the years of the times, you know, what, what's, what's uh, Really interesting is, uh, with all these problems that I'm talking about, uh, in the um, 90s, uh, when, in, you know, I, I can't give you a chapter and verse about exactly why it happened, whether Bill Clinton gets credit or not, but Bill Clinton came in, uh, we were uh, in a tough economic position. The Congress actually raised taxes on people at the top, um, in the second half of the 90s, uh, having balanced the budget, and, and essentially what happened was a, a sense of investor and, and consumer confidence in the country, which all came together. And those people at the top who were now paying somewhat more taxes under the legislation of the early 90s did the best that they had done in a very, very long time. And in fact, if you analyze by party, uh, who's, who, who's in charge in Washington, 
when Democrats are in, actually people at the top do better. So uh, the, the job creator thing, uh, which is based on the idea of, of essentially don't tax us and we'll use our money uh, for other people, it's just factually untrue. So try that out. <laughs> Mine's kind of short. Um, oh, all right. I base it on you talking about Chicago. How yeah. do you suppose that the poverty will change just in that state alone when most of the murders are committed by people who aren't even old enough to vote? Yes. So how would that, how is that going to change when the people that might be doing the wrong things have little young children committing the serious crimes? How would things change if they don't care about going to school, they don't care well, about Well, you're this, talking about, about a huge and awful problem, aren't you? Uh, I mean, the, the, the violence that's taking place uh, in, in Chicago is just, it's just, so awful, uh, but it's another way of framing my question. I mean, the, the uh, number one, somebody who kills somebody goes to jail, right? I mean, that, that, that's we need a criminal justice system, whatever else we do, that people who really do bad things have to go to prison. I mean, that's not our problem with the criminal justice system, except insofar as if we're not putting people who kill people uh, in jail. So. Uh, the, the, the police part of it uh, is, is you know, the tiniest, if you will, beginning of an answer. The question is why is that violence occurring? Uh, at some levels we can't say exactly why. There was a lot less violence in Chicago for uh, a period of time. It now has this terrible resurgence. Uh, in Boston uh, they had in the mid-90s with some things that they did with policing and community leaders, the number of juveniles uh, committing um, homicide over in the late 90s, over a period of about two or three years, was zero. Um, and so you can't, we know some people really tried very hard to, to prevent, you know, to mediate, to get the gangs to, to settle things without going to the point of, of violence. Uh, without fighting over drug turf, all of those things. But the real question is, when they, is what happened when they came on this earth? The real question, they, they weren't born to be killers. Uh, and so they were, in many cases, they were born into families that were dysfunctional. And so it's a very hard, all of these questions I'm talking about are, I mean, it, it, it's going to, you know, Joe Biden does well in the debate, maybe we'll feel better, but uh, anyway, um, there, we really have to tackle the external and the community internal th things that are bringing about that violence so that it doesn't come to the point of occurring in the first place. We could do something about guns in our country, how about that? Yeah, how do 16 year olds get yeah. things that our silencers, extended yeah, videos. Makes yeah, sense. And, and so that's not even on the table in the politics. But anyway, my, my main answer to you is uh, beyond putting the perpetrator in jail, is figuring out how this starts. And, and uh, there's a group in Chicago called the Interrupters. And they're doing the, some of you saw the film, uh, they're interrupting at the point where it already could go this way and that way, like what I was telling you about in, in Boston, and they make a difference. Uh, but we need to interrupt at the beginning. That's what, that's what we need to do with it's the child but the development. It's, it's finding ways to work with those families where, where there really aren't, the parenting isn't good, and, and, and go from there. Uh, I promise you that if somebody goes, the kids go to a school that does a better job, uh, I mean, you have to deal with both education and poverty, right? You can't, if you make the schools perfect, they're going to do better for some kids, but there's still going to be too many kids who don't make it. So you have to deal with the quality of the schools, you have to deal with the poverty, and then, you know, it's a tall order, but, but the violence is a result of other things. As so. far as what you were saying, as far as education, <laughs> Didn't 15,000 teachers just go on strike not too long ago in Chicago? Yes, so. So if the school systems are good, but the teachers don't feel like they're getting paid enough, then the system... Well, that's a little more complicated than that in terms of, of uh, what that strike was about and what it was not about. Uh, 
Uh, the teachers are getting paid very well, and that makes you ask some questions about the, uh, the merits of that strike. Okay, now I want to be very clear with you. Uh, Scott Walker says he wants to destroy public unions. That's a terrible thing, the governor of Wisconsin. Uh, a, a union that opposed for year after year having longer school days and longer school years. And Illinois had, and Chicago had the shortest uh, school year and the shortest school day of any city in the country because the union opposed it. So that's what we have to sit down and have a longer talk about. Thank you for elaborating. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all of you.